So let me uh, welcome everyone. I see the, the, the number of people connecting is increasing. We just start because we have a very um, interesting and um, heavy agenda. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you all. I'm Karine. I'm working at the Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and we are organizing this uh, webinar on the real-time uh, planning and implementing and monitoring of vaccination campaign is kind of series. We had a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago uh, to present you a, um, a guidance on this priority topic for us. And this is a deep dive in the experience of Bangladesh. And we will see what they have done uh, at a very large scale and we will also hear from them what they have learned uh, uh, on very interesting aspects that can be useful for the COVID-19 real-time planning and monitoring. I want to thank all the presenters who will be there. Many, it's very um, interesting work bringing a lot of different uh, people and teams together. And I want to uh, particularly give a big thank you to the government of Bangladesh, who are present and we know that everyone is busy, but you are really uh, kind enough to, to give uh, you time uh, to share your experience. So I'm passing over to Raquel. She's uh, representing UNICEF. UNICEF has been uh, heavily uh, working on this topic and coordinating uh, all the presentations. So over to you, Raquel, and thank you. All right, thank you, Karine. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. Um, my name is Raquel Wexler, and I serve as Headquarters Coordinator for Technology for Development within UNICEF's um, Division of Information and Communication Technology in New York Headquarters, and I'll be serving as moderator of the panel today. Um, please feel free to use the chat and uh, Q&A question and answer uh, features to ask questions and and we'll look to respond to them um, you know during the course of the webinar and there'll be a question and answer uh, segment towards the end of the webinar as well um, so you can see the names of the presenters before you um, we have um, many uh, uh, presenters today and I will ask each to um, introduce themselves at the very top of their remarks next slide uh, so in terms of the structure of the webinar, uh, just to, to give you an idea of the overview, so um, we'll go into the background and overview, uh, we'll be discussing a little bit of the, the Digital Health uh, Center of, of Excellence, we'll be taking a deep dive into uh, Bangladesh real-time monitoring uh, experience uh, with presentations by um, by government and by UNICEF and um, Hispid Bangladesh. Um, we will have a presentation from the University of Oslo uh, looking at DHIS2 toolkit and its adaptation for uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then we'll go to the audience Q&A. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to mention that, uh, you know, this work has really, uh, you know, been an ongoing uh, work of the Gavi Alliance, uh, UNICEF, UNICEF's in, uh, immunization team, the Information Communication Technology Division, uh, with the support of the Digital Health Team, uh, which is uh, supporting the digital transformation um, um, of programming and innovation in UNICEF. Uh, we've been working for the past year on the consolidation of lessons and good practices on the use of real-time monitoring approaches and tools for immunization campaigns across countries, across different campaign phases and use cases. Um, as Karina mentioned in February, uh, earlier this year, um, Gavi and UNICEF, re we released a publication, which you can see before you, the use of digital technologies and approaches for real-time monitoring of supplementary um, immunization campaigns. Uh, which is available, and uh, I would encourage you all to to refer to this document for additional lessons. Um, of course, we are tech agnostic. Um, the country cases look at the deployment of a variety of digital tools and solutions in Pakistan, Uganda, Indonesia, and Zambia, um, in addition to a literature review, which uh, looks at um, many other uh, country cases as well. And the emphasis of this work is ultimately to support the strengthening of national systems and capacities using digital approaches and tools 
Um, and it's critical that we align our work in digital programming and real-time monitoring with national systems and infrastructure, which is currently in place. Now, I also wanna say that this work would not have been possible without the technical and financial support of the Gavi Alliance. And we also thank the, the World Health Organization, our national government partners and, and UNICEF and, and many other uh, inter disciplinary teams across immunization, health, and ICTD uh, who at, at country, regional, and headquarters levels who've, who've enabled this work. And of course, as uh, COVID-19 with vaccinations underway and the need to accelerate learnings and uptake of uh, digital tools and approaches for real-time planning and monitoring for COVAX rollout and delivery, uh, we really recognize the importance of consolidating lessons rapidly as countries learn um, and having learned of uh, Bangladesh's recent and ongoing work uh, using DHIS2 for the 2020 mass uh, measles rubella campaign uh, and for COVID-19 planning and monitoring delivery, we're very thankful uh, to have our national uh, Bangladesh national EPI partners, uh, Hisbi Bangladesh, the University of Oslo, and um, and of course our UNICEF colleagues and others to share uh, their experience with that. And with that, I'd like to pass on to uh, Karen uh, Calendar. Karen, can you introduce yourself? Thank you. You are muted, Karen. Sorry, it's too early for me. Um, Thank you, Raquel. Um, I'm Karin Shalander. I'm a senior health specialist in UNICEF's health section in New York, and I'm also leading the work on digital health. And I wanted to um, speak just very briefly about a new initiative that has been established during uh, the last couple of weeks oh. um, called the Digital Health Center of Excellence. And it stems from, oh, um, yeah, you can go to the next. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, it's with. I don't wanted to frame. Sorry, previous slide. There we go. Um, so I wanted to um, anchor some of the conversations that we're going to listen to today, and some of the work, and how that links to some of the work that we have been discussing and, and preparing together with WHO and Gavi um, for the Covax delivery, and how we in program division in UNICEF see this as a priority as and how it can link to our other work that we are doing for health and immunization. And two of the priority areas we have been uh, uh, sort of working towards and working around for the COVID vaccine delivery is around micro planning and vaccine monitoring and specifically working around sort of establishing standardized approaches to support countries around these two areas of work and um if you go to the next slide the and please can participants mute thank you so from a programming perspective um i think those who work in immunization are very familiar got that if okay um there was a um those who work in immunization are familiar with this cycle of reaching every district, which is a micro planning cycle, which includes a number of steps to uh, sort of understand who the target population is. And this is mainly working for uh, this is mainly being put in place for immunization, routine immunization programs and um, involves a number of steps that uh, is usually typically in many countries of paper-based process working to quantify a uh, target population mapping who the mapping the catchment population where, where children live and, and sort of working towards understanding how um, best distribute vaccines to that population and then it involves a number of red arrows here which are the monitoring side part of the cycle now this is usually an annual cycle and there's quarterly work plan updates yeah. and monthly data reporting. Now, we do see that there's a lot of utilization for improved data for these types of um, cycles to be more uh, optimized. And when we talk about campaigns, we go to pick one more. When we talk specifically about campaigns, um, who's going to click one more to get the next? Yes. 
what we see for campaigns typically is that this last part of this cycle is something that for campaigns need to potentially happen instead of happening on an annual basis we need to have this sort of data and adjustments happening on a weekly basis and maybe even on a daily basis to be able to sort of much better optimize the distribution and this is where we see the use of digital tools there's a number of them like Raquel said that can really um, function to better track and track progress against targets to um, work with communities to track defaulters and etc and we also have um, a number of GIS based solutions that can also be better used to plan and 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 we will hear from Bangladesh how they have utilized sort of micro planning to lead up to the um, to the point of delivery so just to say that for the digital health center of excellence the dice that we are launching there will now be uh, targeted support offered to countries for technical assistance to both these areas of establishing sort of the the population estimates that will be um, that will be needed for for understanding the, the population that will be needing the COVID vaccine as well as this campaign mode uh, for the distribution on how to monitor um, the monitor the data more rapidly and, and using that to inform the campaigns. Next slide. So not to go into too much detail, so DICE, just to mention, is this is, is a multi-agency consortium. UNICEF and WHO are co-hosting this, but UNICEF running the day-to-day the -day operations. So if you want, uh, if you have an uh, interest in a country, if you're working in a country and you know that there is government interest in um, and that there's a need for technical assistance to um, to to in institute or implement some of these digital solutions for micro planning or for real time monitoring and vaccination monitoring, do send an email. We have an address and uh, we can see if there is a way that we can channel some of that technical assistance through the dice. Next slide. And over to the next speaker. So yeah, I'm handing over now to Dr. Mola from um, Bangladesh. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Now I am going to present Real-time monitoring okay. for Surveilla campaign 2020 in Bangladesh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Yeah. We see you and yeah. everything yeah. is fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now I am going to present real-time monitoring from Bangladesh. This is Dr. Maula. Nationally for Major Surveilla campaign. Bangladesh conducted last measles rubella can chop campaign in 2014. 85 to 95 percent of children received first dose and 80 to 85 percent received second dose of measles rubella vaccine from 2016 to 2019. Surveillance data indicated measles incidence increased from 1.6 per million in 2015 to 29 per million in 2019. Similarly, number of lab-confirmed measles outbreak increased from 4 in 2015 to 82 in 2019. Due to COVID-19 pandemic situation, Bangladesh rescheduled postponed measles rubella from 12 December 2020 to 3 February 2021 with revised strategies. Next slide. Next, please. Just one second. Thank you. Why DHS2 as a platform for RTM? Since 2013, EPI is using DHS2 for routine EPI reporting, vaccine and logistic management, and cold gen equipment inventory. Oil trade personnel on use of DHIS2 at all level. Field staff are familiar with reporting using DHIS2. 
Organization units required for MR campaign planning and reporting are already exist in DHIS2. Plan to use the same platform of routine API microplan for MR campaign planning and reporting. RTM in MR campaign. Online microplan, daily vaccination reporting including vaccine and logistic use, session supervision through Android app, house to house visit by first line supervisor through Android app, rapid convenience monitoring by second line supervisor through Android app. Next. Why online micro planning and real time monitoring for Mrs. Rubella campaign? Ensure overall quality of the campaign. Ensure equitable high coverage through close monitoring of achievement against target by session. Fixing actual target as per micro plan. Continuous monitoring the quality of campaign and immediate action to rectify and improve. Find out missed children and ensure vaccination of all missed children through mop up session. Daily vaccine and logistic management plan and monitor vaccine and logistic stock. Online micro plan and real time monitoring help to conduct quality campaign when physically monitoring option was very limited due to COVID-19 pandemic situation. Major partners, technical assistance, and implementation EPI, DGHS, GAVI, UNICEF, WHO. System development and server maintenance, MIS, DGHS, UNICEF, University of Oslo, and DHIS2 community. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Monitoring of MR campaign using real time data. Monitor campaign quality and miss children through supervision app and household visit app. Rapid convenient monitoring app used to monitor session and cold chain community awareness and coverage. All level managers monitored the campaign through review and analysis of microplan, report and data from supervision, house to house visit and RCM app. National monitoring cell daily monitored campaign coverage and analyzed data from supervision, house to house visit and rapid convenient monitoring app. Conducted division wise online review meeting with subdivisional level managers using real time dashboard and provided necessary instruction to the specific unit. A special team visited field to validity, validate reporting data when mismatch of data found during real-time monitoring. Next, please. Lesson learned, challenges and successes. Challenges, commitment from all partners for successful implementation of any innovations, Capacity of some agent workers to use new technology. Shortage of dedicated person for data entry at sub-national level. Sub-national capacity to provide software and server related support. Successes, strong leadership and commitment from national level. Multi-stakeholder involvement, especially University of Oslo, DHS2 community and MIS DGHS. Successfully introduced all six innovations and completed campaign maintaining quality and coverage 104% during COVID-19. Additional missed children reached with vaccination, building confidence to introduce technology-based innovations. Thanks. Thank you all. Well, now, you, now, now I would like to request UNICEF Bangladesh to come up with their presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mola, and uh, warm greetings to everybody from UNICEF Bangladesh and the team here. 
Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mala, for that excellent overview and the exciting piece of work that was done in Bangladesh and sharing that. I think our job is really to see the that how was it done and how did we actually use DHIS2 for real-time monitoring, but also more importantly, how we're using that experience now um, to uh, monitor some of the work happening with COVID-19. So I'll be joined with two of my colleagues and my team, uh, Jahid Shahid, as well as Masood Parvez in doing this presentation. Next slide, please. So the first big piece that is is on the slide in front of you is what exactly did we achieve? And we've heard already from Dr. Mahler, but there was a real success in terms of the daily monitoring that we could do and because of this real-time monitoring system that was set up, we were able to identify the areas that were having the missed children and quickly do the mop-ups. We were able to also monitor the session quality and address any gaps, as well as identify missed children for the routine immunization. If you just do another click, we'll see the numbers. And uh, we can see the, the impressive reach here, over 36 million children vaccinated. We can see the numbers of sessions, household visits, rapid convenience survey that was done, as well as the missed children that were identified for routine doses. So pretty impressive results. I'll hand over to Shahid to tell us how exactly this took place. So Shahid, please. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjana. Jason Shahid, working as a health officer at UNICEF, Bangladesh. So, uh, as you've seen, we use DHS2 as our main information system for the real time monitoring of this campaign. So, we have been developed the micro planning and daily vaccination reporting tools using the aggregate data sets. And the data visualizer apps we used for the preparing the daily vaccine and logistic distribution plan. And for the supervision, household visit, and the RCM apps, we use the DHS to capture apps. And then another one is we we develop a public dashboard since it doesn't need any authentication required. So for the real time monitoring, which is developed through a PHP framework. Next, yeah. thank you. So as I uh, as I said earlier, we developed the online micro planning tool using the aggregate data set. Three types of the micro planning data sets you see on the right side of the micro plan form. The three types of the micro plan data set were developed for the outreach one, the fixed center, including the heart reach and the high risk areas. So through this online micro plan data set, following information we are collected: the session site name, date, the number of target children. Who are the vaccinators, their names, supervisor, porters, and the volunteers' name and their mobile number. And also, you see the there is a uh, use of this micro plan. They just need to enter the micro plan target, and all the other vaccine logistic required for the station sites are prepared on fly. So we use actually the DHS2 indicator to preparing these uh, these vaccine logistic requirement for the calculation. And the next. The vaccine and logistic distribution plan we use that as the data visualizer. So within just a few clicks, the EPA person get this required number of, of vaccine and logistic information. Sorry, the earlier one. Yes, this one. Okay. So earlier, this was a months long laborious work for the vaccinators and the API persons to get these required number of vaccine and logistic information. But this time they got this information fly. They just need to enter their number of targets children. You see, there are more than 400,000 campaign sites micro plan data submitted using these micro plan data sets. And the, for the daily vaccine and logistic distribution plan and were prepared through the data visualizer apps, the user just need uh, preparing these vaccine and management plan within a few clicks. So as, a, as you know, this vaccine logistic management plan also a very laborious and months long work for the EPA personnel, but, but this time these plans prepared by a few clicks at the local level. And for the daily vaccination information, such as the coverage, the vaccine and logistic uses, the reporting, and instantly they see the words of their coverage and the vaccination was 
fixed is and the loss t first is real. So these real-time monitoring tools, the decision making and the planning of the corrective actions was possible. Even the national and subnational health managers were able to observe the campaign performance progress up to the lowest unit in real time. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. So another another feature of the supervision and monitoring. The, we observe the qualitative and quantitative aspect by the session observation through these supervision apps. So during this campaign, the session quality issues such as the whether their educated HR is available or not, are they following non-touch technique, what is the condition of the cold chain, all of these are monitored and addressed during this campaign through these supervision apps. And another one is the household visit app. The first line user were conducted the household visit app, visit apps to find out the missed children and coverage of the hard to reach and high risk areas. We also monitored the campaign quality coverage, the community awareness, and also find out the missed children and the camp uh, of the campaign, including the routine immunization through the RCMFs is conducted by the second line supervisor from national to subnational level health managers. And so the independent observers and the development partners. So these supervision and monitoring data helps local and national level health managers to ensure the campaign quality and achieve the coverage of this campaign. And you see, since all of these are Android apps, so these works in both online and offline. So all the supervision and monitoring can conduct it where there is no network and low network connections, including the hard to reach area. However, this is first time we are using these apps for the campaign supervision and monitoring. Previously, all the, uh, however, this is the first time we are using these apps, but all the national and subnational manager use their Android apps for, for, the, for this campaign supervision and monitoring. And previously, uh, a paper-based checklist format, so there was no scope for this campaign monitoring and, and decision making in real time. Next please. Next please. Yeah, the lesson learned. So one of the key lesson learned is the use of existing technology is the key of success. It helps us also to strengthen our management information system and the health of the Bangladesh. And the second one, the government ownership and support from the all sector and the development partners such as WHO, UNICEF, also a key of success. And the most important, the user-friendly apps, to develop user-friendly apps, the comprehensive interactive training, and also the motivation of the user can lead technology-based innovation without providing any additional devices, such as in our MR campaign, supervision and monitoring conducted by the all subnational, national, and the field supervisors use their own devices. So now, uh, and also we could say that now these uh, these apps are well tested also. We believe that these DHS to Android apps can be used at large scale implementation of any program, either routine or campaign. And the, but the last not the least, the dedicated technical team must be required for this continuous troubleshooting, the server maintenance systems, and the server upgradation, etc. So thank you all. Now I'd like to request Mr. Masood Parvez, my colleague, to continue the rest of the slides. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shahed, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so when EPI program decided that they would use DHS2 for EMAR campaign, uh, EMI's department from DG Health uh, has provided all the required infrastructure support. Uh, they provided a virtual server with backup functionality. Then we configured the server uh, and fine-tuned it for the optimum performance, especially for the large uh, concurrent connection. Next, please. So this is a theme uh, thematical uh, architecture of the EMI campaign system. As you can see, all the uh, health worker from public health facility uploads their uh, regular micro plan and reporting data through DHS2 web application. 
and first line supervisor, second line supervisor, uh, and the observer will uh, use their mobile application through DHS2 mobile app to upload data for uh, supervision, household visit, and RCM. This mobile application definitely supports the offline functionality, uh, which helps us a lot because in hard to reach area where there is no internet or the weak internet active uh, internet connection then still user could upload or user could enter the data based on this data all data goes to the uh, connection goes to the proxy server which is nginx uh, we used it for the connection load balance we developed two server one is for training and one is for live we used uh, updated dhs2 and postgresql for optimum performance one of the main challenge was to create a large number of organization and user uh, which is required for MR campaign. As you can see, we have created half a million organization in it and 16,000 users uh, using automated script. Uh, there are database uh, backup functionality and server monitoring functionality also available there. Next, please. So Bangladesh is the first country to use DHS2 for uh, MR campaign monitoring in large scale. So when we started the campaign, we faced some performance issue because of large number of organization we need in web version as well as Android version. University of Oslo technical team from day one, they are also monitoring the system. So when we discuss with them about the problem, uh, they uh, come up with a new solution with two Patch release one is for web version and one is for Android version within a very short period of time. As you can see in my below graph, when we uploaded the patch in the server after uh, 14th and 16th December, uh, everything went normal and server performed as it expected. Next, please. So, country learned a lot. Uh, through this uh, large scale uh, MR campaign implementation using DHS2, all the health manager and uh, statistician got training during this uh, campaign period. Uh, so based on this training and uh, our uh, long history of development of community level individual tracking system, COVID-19 surveillance system implementation took no time at all. So within two or three days, we get started to get the data. Uh, then several bug fixing from the EMA campaign experience uh, also introduced in the COVID-19 surveillance system, which improves the server performance. Based on this successful experience of EMA campaign, now the DG Health is thinking about to use this uh, uh, Android-based application in COVID-19 surveillance system, aiming to improve the completeness and quality of data. Next, please. So this is the COVID-19 surveillance system. There are several aggregate data system which collects port of entry, uh, daily hospital uh, facility information, et cetera. Uh, more than 2 million individual uh, record uh, is there uh, with uh, clinical assessment, lab test request, lab test result, and uh, health outcome information. SMS notification and online reporting is also available. Vaccine logistic management information system is incorporated. This initiative is financially supported by UNICEF and technically uh, supported by his Bangladesh. Next, please. So UNICEF uh, also supported uh, DG Health with two public dashboards. One is COVID-19 surveillance, which uh, collects data from different sources like DHS2, SCMP portal for logistic management information system, and DG Health Control Room database. From citizen and uh, all the citizen and uh, journalists also use this web portal to extract data for daily trend analysis, uh, especially for COVID-19 confirmed cases and death by geographical location, gender, and age. It also has some public API, uh, API so that other systems can use this data for their reporting, especially uh, Android app and other web portal as well. Next, please. Next, please. So th this is another dashboard for the COVID-19 vaccination purpose, where we can monitor the daily coverage of the first dose and second dose vaccination 
uh, especially gender based and geographic location based. Uh, uh, vaccine logistic management information monitoring system is also there and vaccine wastage rate calculation is still under processing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And so now we'll proceed uh, with the presentation from the University of Oslo. Uh, Rebecca, can you kindly uh, introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much. So I work with the University of Oslo, part of the uh, the HISP group, the Health Information Systems Program, and I am our um, technical lead for the global health content. And so I work quite closely with UNICEF and with WHO on um, our, our standardized uh, designs and metadata packages for DHIS2 to support the global guidelines. Um, so today I'm, I'm happy to share with you a bit of the consolidation of some lessons learned from the Bangladesh campaign experience, as well as some earlier experience from Uganda and some implications for, um, for the COVID-19 vaccine delivery that's underway in many countries at this point. So um, just to give you a bit of background, so DHIS2 already has quite a large uh, global footprint. So 61 countries are using it as a, as a national scale HMIS. Um, and we know that 48 countries are using DHIS2 for their routine EPI programs. Um, and then in addition to that, 34 of those countries have actually adopted the WHO standard EPI module for DHIS2. So the footprint among DHIS2 use for EPI is, is already quite large, and this is the foundation that we've been building upon. Next slide, please. So I'm providing here a bit of an overview and a little bit of a mapping to a maturity model that we had developed. So we have collaborated with uh, WHO for the last uh, since, I don't know, four or five years, since around 2017, to develop um, a DHIS2 toolkit that supports the WHO's EPI program guidance. And so this has continued to expand over the last couple of years. We started with the core EPI module, um, which was around, you know, routine immunization program data, um, that also included facility level logistics data reporting. Um, and since then, we've been working to expand a number of apps and tools and solutions. And so we've um, categorized these as, as optimized, which means this is WHO approved DHIS2 solution and it's been replicated at national scale in many countries. So we consider it to be quite optimized and fit for purpose. There are some solutions that we say are still developing. So they've been developed based on WHO guidelines or have been approved, um, but they're still in the process of being rolled out or scaled up in countries. So we're still kind of learning what that means in terms of uh, replicability. Um, and then in terms of defined are some sort of novel use cases that are still uh, representing more innovation with the platform and, and not yet at a place where we can say we're fully optimized. So within this toolkit, um, we consider right now the mass campaign use case is, is a developing one. And I will share a little bit more about uh, what we have learned so far. Next slide. So in terms of implementation considerations for campaigns, um, a lot of these items, they look quite familiar, but how we how we manage them for these supplemental immunization activities has uh, a bit of uh, unique considerations for different components. Um, so in terms of the planning and ensuring that uh, the planning is working across these different stakeholders, but also with the budget considerations for frequency of data collection, for hardware, uh, for the supervision required, and, and how is this going to work in an SIA activity versus the routine use cases that many countries already have in place. Um, I'll discuss in the next slide a bit more about design, uh, but also really providing dedicated time for testing as part of this planning processes. So that would include the user acceptance testing, as well as, as performance testing, trying to stress test um, and simulate um, what, what's going to happen with your server, um, what's the kind of scale of data that you can, you can manage um, before you might need to make some improvements. And, and in order to do that, helping to have sort of a rehearsal or a dry run also really helps with that. Um, the training for field teams for data collection to, to the supervisors for monitoring, um, trying to bring that sort of a first line troubleshooting support close to the ground as, as much as possible. Um, and establishing these strong field support mechanisms during the campaign so that as uh, issues arise, there can be sort of an escalated approach um, to being able to solve these small issues as close to the ground as possible and being able to es escalate any issues that arise. So if it's just 
users not knowing how to log in versus um, potentially having some, some challenges with their server performance, which would go higher up. And uh, the last component is really planning out um, what, what are the kind of operational mechanisms and, and who are these command centers, who, who needs access to this real-time monitoring and data for action throughout the campaign. Um, I will also just mention uh, there's still a little gap around how do we take this SIA campaign data and potentially um, be able to store it, for example, in the HMIS for, for future reference. Um, next slide. In terms of uh, design and configuration, um, I've summarized some of the things that we have learned by close engagement with both Bangladesh and with Uganda. And in terms of the metadata structure, so a lot of the core data that's being captured and monitored around doses administered and target population groups, the sort of stock on hand at that site level, the metadata structure in DHIS2 is actually very quite similar to the routine system. Um, but what is really changing quite a bit is terms of uh, the frequency of data reporting and the selection of the data model. So, for example, in the Bangladesh case, uh, they had the aggregate daily reporting, these sort of data sets of the core immunization data um, in terms of the doses administered, for example. But they also added a layer of individual level data capture for, for their uh, rapid convenience monitoring. So they actually combined these different types of data sets. Um, we also know that there are considerations, there are changes from the routine facility reporting hierarchy that need to be considered and, and designing this according to the operational structure of the campaign. So whether our sub-district sub campaign teams, these rural versus urban delivery sites, and if that model looks different in the delivery, as well as somehow being able to account for uh, community outreach section, uh, sessions and things like that. Um, so we do recommend that if it can be aligned as much as possible with the HMIS hierarchy, for example, down to district. That's going to make data analysis and integration in the future much, much easier. But then once you get below that district, the types of kind of organizational or um, administrative units, they look a little different than a routine system. In terms of uh, dashboards for real-time monitoring, so um, we have seen that there's a customization of dashboards, so kind of creating a custom dashboard app um, is often desired, so it still uses the core functionality of DHIS2 and particularly a pretty robust model for um, being able to disseminate dashboards according to user access at different levels. So a district site will see uh, their district level sub-district data, whereas the national command center will see uh, have visibility across all of the districts in operation. And then we've also seen that uh, special attention needs to be paid to user configuration as well. And really thinking of that in terms of the design process, there can be a huge number of users. We need to consider the access and the roles. And I think sometimes we are tempted to make shortcuts like sharing user accounts, one per district. Um, but we've realized that that can create some problems down the road when we're trying to um, troubleshoot or kind of visit some, some audit trails or also just identify users that were experiencing issues and being able to isolate that problem. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of uh, scale, so some considerations for scale, as you saw from Bangladesh, um, you know, their org unit hierarchy, because of this operations of the campaign, they had more than 500,000 org units. So that's really quite large. Um, many countries in Africa, for example, they, they might only have two a couple thousand, a couple thousand org units in their HMIS. So 500,000 plus is really quite large um, yeah. in terms of the number of users. <laughs> so, so you need to anticipate for not only the number of users, um, but also the number of concurrent users. So many times you might have a huge rush of data entry happening at the same time during the day. So if everyone is submitting their reports between 4 and 5 p.m. at the uh, end of the campaign day, you need to not know, only know how many users, but also how many are trying to access and push to the system and include that in your uh, performance testing. I think those considerations for scaling aggregate versus scaling tracker or individual level data. So what type of data model also needs to be considered? Um, of course, in an individual level model, there's a lot more metadata being synced all the time. So it has more pressure. Um, thinking about the mode of, of uh, data capture, so DHIS2 Android is, is quite optimized for offline support, but also recognizing when is all of that data going to come online and push to the server right away. Um, the analytics processing, so for example, DHIS2 now has um, sort of a real-time analytics table generation, but that should also be tested and making sure that the analytics tables are updating at the time um, when all of the real-time monitoring dashboards are being accessed as well. 
And the last component to really think about is this planning, the being able to plan for the performance testing and using some of the server monitoring tools that um, UNICEF Bangladesh had shown some examples from and, and building up that capacity to be able to make real time adjustments uh, during during the campaign. Next slide, please. Um, we'll pay a little close attention to, to this service, server management, um, the way that server management works in different countries. Um, some work with an MOH data center or another data center with a country. Some are working with cloud hosted systems, um, but making sure there's that strong communication between uh, whoever is sort of managing those servers and, and providing the hosting and having a dedicated relationship throughout the, the length of the campaign. Um, also being able to plan ahead in terms of server specs. Um, so you really do need a good quality fast SSD disk. Um, but we also found that it's really good to plan for excess capacity. So when you have kind of cloud-based hosting, it's very easy to be elastic and scale as needed. But if you're relying on hardware in country, um, you really need to think through that as the campaign gets going, you don't know everything right away and you want to be able to reprovision some extra resources rapidly if you find that they're needed. And of course, the last component that we had mentioned was the server monitoring tools, but also this live application profiling. So this was really useful in terms of being able to connect uh, the DHIS2 developers um, and also with um, some of the UNICEF Bangladesh st staff to be able to troubleshoot some, some complex issues, but without necessarily giving them access to the system or the data that they should not have access to. Uh, next slide. So this is an example of, this is actually Uganda's real-time monitoring dashboard. So this is actually a, a custom app that's built on top of DHIS2 to give them the user interface that they really wanted to have. So this component of being able to customize the dashboard app, but use the functionality of DHIS2, it seems to be common uh, between Uganda and Bangladesh. Um, designing those dashboard metrics, um, they should really be driven by these key campaign metrics and, and how are they going to be monitored. And what we have seen is a strength is to be able to have this multi-level access to support. So in, as an example from Uganda, they had a national command center, but also some national levels. Um, and we, we expect this to be, to be common across many, um, many campaigns. Um, again, with continuous analytics and considerations for scale, um, but also being able to integrate this dashboard and, and linking that with the command and operational decision-making structures and uh, using this in a way that day by day some decisions can be made to optimize that campaign. Next slide, please. From here, I will revisit. Um, okay, so so just to give a little bit of an intro and Hanan Khan, a colleague from His Bangladesh, will follow up. Um, we have been working with many countries, with WHO and with UNICEF, to, to support countries to use DHIS2 for monitoring their uh, national COVID-19 vaccine delivery plans. So at this point, we have uh, 24 countries who are operational. Most of them have some sort of combination between an aggregate uh, kind of core reporting and analytics module and, and a tracker-based uh, electronic registry, as well as adverse events reporting. And we have another eight, probably more countries who are in development. So this, this use case is already gaining traction, and we have some early lessons to learn in terms of where have we drawn um, some some linkages between the campaign use case and this COVID-19 vaccine delivery, which seems to sit a little bit almost in the middle between supplemental immunization activity like an MR campaign and this sort of routine distribution through um, through health facilities. So, so for us, we're seeing there's there's some similarities and lessons learned from from both models of delivery. Next slide. Um, so here's where I will uh, revisit our maturity model in terms of COVID-19 vaccine delivery and some of our early learning. Um, so we do believe that DHIS2 is, is quite optimized for real-time daily reporting and monitoring of aggregate data. Um, we really do believe this kind of scaling up this aggregate module is probably going to be quite feasible in, in most countries and contexts. Um, in terms of the dashboards, I had this listed as somewhere between optimized and developing because we do believe a lot of this can be achieved out of the box with the system functionality that's there. Um, we do support, for example, conduct uh, calculating indicators on the fly. Um, we do support multi-level analysis, um, but we also recognize that um, there's user interface design and, and customization um, that, that many countries are, are asking for to really support this use case. 
Um, in terms of mobile aggregate data collection, I, I would also say this is developing. I think this really has the potential to scale. Um, but in addition to, to DHIS2 considerations, this, this is also around um, having seen, so I think if I'm interpreting Bangladesh's experience correctly, a lot of the core data uh, entry was happening at web, and then there was a subset, a substantial number of users, so it was really quite at scale. Um, but these types of users doing the rapid convenience monitoring, so they were doing this kind of hand in hand. What we have not seen yet is a fully DHIS2 Android at 100% scale happening. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see what countries are, are looking for. And, and the last piece is that individual level mobile data collection. So as you saw from the Bangladesh case, um, this was used for rapid convenience monitoring and some components of this um, deployment. Um, but where we have not seen this at scale is, for example, there's not really been any effort, nor there might not ever need to be, but being able to report this really kind of individual level um, kind of case by case uh, persons being registered as having been um, and uh, vaccinated as part of this campaign. But we also have some learnings from malaria bed net campaigns where um, some individual household level uh, surveys have been done. So we're continuing to explore and learn from this use case. Um, I believe this will be my final slide. Yes, and, and so just a summary of our lessons learned. So one thing I wanted to emphasize is, is how much our developers have been able to learn from, from Bangladesh and Uganda both. Um, by having some close collaboration, we've been able to learn a lot about the use case and the requirements, and we're very grateful to the Ministries of Health, to UNICEF uh, Bangladesh, for actually spending some time with us to, to explain the design, how they've managed these uh, configuration decisions. Um, but it's also been incredibly useful for us to have a focused performance testing um, and being able to test DHIS2 against these really real world use cases that are very well defined and targeted. And we've been able to uh, make what we believe are some significant performance improvements um, across um, real time monitoring dashboards, as well as the tracker data model and, and some other things. So we hope that those improvements are going to to benefit uh, any country who wishes to use DHIS2 or Android in the future. Um, but we will just leave with a few reflections that is um, ensure to, to plan for testing. Um, if there's a mobile data, data collection component to ensure that there's dedicated pre preparation for this component, um, being able to thoroughly test the configuration before rollout, um, building up these tools and plans for a detailed monitoring throughout the campaign to ensure an optimized performance. Um, and this, this simplicity of the real-time monitoring dashboards seem to have had a huge impact. So um, designing those dashboards in the beginning with key campaign metrics and those data users is something that we would recommend. Um, so thank you very much for, for letting us join you and, and, and summarize a few of our, our observations and learnings. And I'm very happy to pass over to, to my colleague, Hanan. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. So uh, I am Hanan Khan, team leader of Bangladesh. So uh, uh, Bangladesh is supporting DHS to Bangladesh implementation uh, for long, and I am personally involved with the DHS implementation since 2010. So uh, in uh, COVID surveillance system is uh, in Bangladesh is actually uh, quite uh, large, and it starts with uh, uh, March. 22nd March uh, 2020, when actually the Director General asked an earlier week uh, in the beginning of March to start with the DHS2 for the surveillance system. Uh, so what we have actually, we took the University of Oslo, the core generic uh, module uh, for DHS2 surveillance system and customized for our local requirement. But it's day by day it's become uh, quite very large and uh, it's actually not only the surveillance system, is actually the whole uh, combination of multiple systems to, to join together. So if I uh, so if you see the diagram, so I think it will help you to understand. Uh, so this is actually the main system. So as a nutshell, our COVID surveillance system right now today we have. COVID surveillance system right now, we have the total number of suspect cases is 4.2 million, and the total test done is 4.44 million. 
and confirmed positive case is 619 uh, 619,000. Total active user is 1,746. So it's quite a norm, a big system. Uh, so not only uh, is that the COVID test data case based and aggregate system, it's also have vaccine reporting, vaccine logistics and real time hospital status. Uh, and you see, if you see that we have the several system integration and other, other uh, linkages with the API integration with the multiple other systems. So first we we start with the uh, the public app, which is self uh, service app for the COVID diagnosis self diagnosis app, and then we go to facilitate the all dashboard from the same single source. So Mr. Masood already shows several dashboards, and uh, so all dashboards are actually feed from the DHS two systems. Uh, not only that, the all labs, including government and private facilities, are actually sharing the data directly, either directly to the DHS2 system or a middleware system where they have kind of enter Excel-like system. Those are not familiar with the DHS2 or not want to enter in the DHS2. Those have the other system. They also can send DHS2 to the, the National Corona Care Network. So this is actually the total overall uh, architecture of the whole of the COVID surveillance system. And uh, we day by day, we actually uh, into accommodating the new requirement. For example, now we are incorporating two requ requests. One is for the self-service uh, COVID uh, testing requirement, and another one is the hospital system integration. So this two API is uh, on integration is on the way, and hopefully uh, next week it will be uh, deployed. So this is uh, actually the overall picture of the whole COVID integration. Uh, total COVID integration to show actually take a longer time. Uh, and uh, from March, uh, we started the COVID surveillance system and uh, UNICEF, uh, we got UNICEF technical support from the 1st of August. And uh, thanks to the UNICEF, because otherwise uh, for containing uh, to the supporting the government and the COVID surveillance system would be difficult for us. So we actually uh, for the uh, take the experience from the UNICEF MR campaign to actually the optimize the server and the self source a lot to to make the server optimized and make operational. So this is uh, I think all my quota for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's uh, just, uh, uh, oh, I think it's not, uh, I'm not showing the good uh, screen. So let me retry. Sorry for that. I think it's working better now. I just uh, uh, wanted to, to say thank you, but quickly, um, I just wanted to say that we, we are going to, we plan to stay 15 more minutes for question and answer. And I just wanted to do a quick point on the Gavi priorities and funding opportunities. So actually real-time monitoring as a short name for real-time implementing and planning and all of that. So the real-time monitoring intervention are among our uh, digital health information priority for our new strategy for Gavi, the Gavi 5.0 strategy and also is among the priority for the COVID-19 vaccine delivery. And, and this can be supported uh, uh, via Gavi funding for operational cost and technical assistance. Uh, and I just put some reference uh, about the, the application guidelines. We are just changing strategy, so all our material is changing, but uh, we, you can keep uh, yourself uh, aware of our, all our documentation in our a Gavi website that will be um, revamped in, in a couple of weeks. So this is just for reference and we are going to share the slides so you will have all the, all the links there. So we are going to uh, do the question and answers and I will ask kindly Raquel to come in for the moderation. Uh, we can stay yeah. a bit longer because there is a lot of uh, interest. Exactly. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists uh, for their very um, it, it rich uh, uh, presentations today. There was a lot of content shared, um, and I see that there were a number of questions that were um, posed and answered in the chat uh, so far. Um, 
So, uh, but I did want to ask uh, our colleague, um, Matthew Thomas, I see uh, you had mentioned that some of your questions had been answered and, and I wanted to see if you would be able to unmute yourself uh, to uh, pose any remaining question before we go on to the next person. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much for the excellent um, presentations. It's extremely valuable to hear this context, particularly of a successful case. I'm so um, honored to be presented by all the colleagues. I'm, uh, I'm, I just had some questions in chat and I'm grateful for people responding to them in line on the details on how the real time monitoring component actually you know, of supported changing or adapting the program on the ground, oh. um, as well as I think some colleagues referenced on lessons uh, learned for what could potentially be done with national COVID-19 vaccination uh, campaigns uh, um, and the, the opportunity for, you know, building out for uh, product traceability or systems, uh, because it just seemed a lot of, a lot of data collection um, and analysis. Uh, so as this supports better decision making, that's great. Um, and just really curious about other ways to support um, management of immunization campaigns. So thanks for the opportunity to listen and to pose these questions to an extremely skilled group. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues online, could you kindly mute if, if you're not speaking? Thank you. Just to uh, uh, put back your mic on, uh, I have muted everyone, Raquel. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, I will perhaps we proceed with uh, with Hassan Ulbari, who has raised his hand in the chat. My question is like uh, during the Bangladesh EMR uh, campaign, they have mentioned that they use the app Android application. So it is uh, something already there or they uh, created or developed this new app? Thank you for your question. Uh, perhaps um, Bangladesh uh, uh, colleagues can respond and, um, and potentially University of Oslo as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Hassan. Actually, we are using the DHS to capture apps, which is available in the uh, Google Play Store. And also you will get the latest version of the Android apps just recently updated by the University of Oslo. So this, uh, we are using the, the Android second version uh, provide, uh, for the DHS to capture apps for this application. Thank you. Great, Rebecca, um, did you want to come in and compliment? Can, can you please replace, repeat the p last 10 seconds of the question? I was getting some connection issue. Uh, my, my question was like, uh, uh, did they use any existing application or did they develop any new application for these uh, activities? Okay, very clear, sorry about that. Um, so in, in Uganda, for the mobile data collection, they actually used ODK because uh, the users already had ODK and were quite familiar with it. So the HISP Uganda team sort of set up a solution where they could, they had to pay very careful attention to make sure that they were structuring the data properly in ODK because it's very easy to kind of create some messy data structures in ODK, which then leads to data that's really impossible to, to analyze. Um, but being able to set up and structure that data collection and align it to the kind of monitoring and indicators uh, metadata structure in DHIS2 actually ended up working quite well. So that's actually how they did it in Uganda. Um, and in, in Bangladesh, they use the uh, standard DHIS2 Android app. So this is a completely, um, you know, it's a generic app, just like uh, DHIS2 software is quite generic until you define it. So they use the core app, um, but the DHIS2 Android cap app is natively integrated with DHIS2. So whatever you design and configure in DHIS2 it is immediately available for those uh, data entry users on mobile. Um, so as far as I know, there was no customization involved in that. This is just one of the core global public goods that we support uh, from University of Oslo. So I, I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much. 
Um, now I would like to ask uh, Santosh Uru uh, to unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Santosh. I'm with the EPI team in WHO headquarters. Thank you all for the very informative presentation. Just wanted to kind of get one clarification and I put it in the chat for the COVID, but I just wanted to kind of get an idea. There's, there, there is a micro panic stage and there is a reporting for the RTM that I'm, I'm kind of figuring at this point, right? So for at least for the COVID, thanks for uh, the clarification in the chat, but I think for the measles, rubella, SIA, is that also sitting with two different um, ministries, uh, like the ICD and the Ministry of Health for the micro planning and for the monitoring? That's my first uh, point, maybe just for clarification. And the second thing is more, more of a detailed question in terms of the just the micro planning and the reporting. Is, is there a phase when uh, the micro planning is happening and then we are also doing some sort, some sort of a pre register, uh, like a pre registration of the target groups? Are we going to that level of details, and um, and 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 also the registration process when when the people actually come to, uh, come to get vaccinated, right? So, just wanted to kind of understand what's the impact because especially there is so much of the actual coverage uh, that's that's happening during the campaign, and there is the RCM, and there's the mop up, and there's the house to house visit. I just wanted to kind of get a feel on how that connection is being made. Over, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions there around um, ministries and roles and responsibilities um, and around pre-registration and registration um, at the time of the campaign. Um, can our UNICEF uh, Bangladesh or EPI uh, partners of Bangladesh uh, kindly respond? Thank you. Um, Rakul, may I answer the questions, please? <laughs> so, uh, before going to Shantosh's question, there was another uh, question from Matthew about the how the real-time monitoring helped to rectify the campaign. To answer this question, I, I, I just uh, want to put two examples. Uh, in, we did the session supervision with the app, real-time app, the supervision app, where the quality component was there. I mean, just one example that uh, non-touch techniques are followed or not. So now from the uh, supervision through app, a manager can check that uh, which union the non-touch technique is not followed. So he can, he took the action uh, through the, I mean, uh, on job training of that, uh, of the vaccinator that you are not following that, the non-touch technique, so you can follow. So this type of quality rectification done through online uh, real-time monitoring. And I want to give another example of uh, real-time monitoring, how we improve the coverage that through the household visit app, any uh, super, uh, supervisor or manager from any level, subnational and national level, they can, um, they could monitor that there was uh, missed children found in household visit app. So they planned for the mop-up session and covered those uh, unvaccinated children. This is how the real-time monitoring uh, helped to rectify the campaign quality and uh, got the desired coverage. And now come to the question to the uh, Shantosh. Yeah, the registration, you know, we, we planned the campaign in, uh, in the uh, February of 2020, before the uh, COVID pandemic. That time, all the uh, registration of target children done by the worker visiting each household of their catchment area. But when due to pandemic, the campaign suspend and we rescheduled the campaign in December 2020, that time uh, household visit was not possible due to the pandemic situation, but they reviewed that registration list and cross check with their connection through um, to the guardians and made the target for the each session and they put this target children in their micro plan data set and they uh, completed the data entry in the micro plan data set in DHS2 before campaign started, before uh, five days before the campaign start. So once they uh, uh, completed their micro plan data set, we blocked the micro plan data set. So after that, they cannot change the micro plan. Um, 
market band target. So when the session actually uh, happened, that they only entered the report, reporting uh, data that how much vaccinated, uh, how much children is vaccinated. So the micro plan and the reporting all were in the DHS2 and uh, target children were fixed from the previous PlayStation. And the, these RCM, household budget and supervision, these are linked, all linked because uh, you know the DHS2, the, in DHS2, the, every site was there for the micro and reporting as an organization unit. And the session and the household visit was done in that site, so which was in the organization unit. So we could easily link the RCM supervision household visit findings and the uh, reporting. So I think, I, um, and the ministry, I mean, for the COVID vaccination, our ICT ministry developed a app, Shuroka app. Through this app, all the uh, target people are registering by themselves through mobile app in the uh, Shuroka apps. So they're registering, but after their registration, the vaccination plan is done at the facility level. From For each facility, they have one admin who can check how many people are registered for their center. Uh, center. I mean, while, while registration, every individual choose the center from where he wants to get the vaccine. So when he choose one center, that center admin people can see that, yes, these people are uh, registered for our center for vaccination. Then he can, he plan that these day, these, these people, these, these final people will be vaccinated. And he plan uh, digitally in the app and uh, send the SMS to, the, to those people that you come on that day for the vaccination. This is done by the ICT ministry, but the MR campaign and the COVID surveillance, COVID uh, reporting, VLMS, all are done by the Ministry of Health, which is done under uh, with the uh, help of DHS2. Uh, I think I can refer to Shantos. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for clarifying mm -hmm. and responding to those questions. Uh, I would like to ask uh, so, so Odros. Uh, uh, to... uh, just to, Heracle, give me one minute to supplement uh, sure. this earlier question. Yes. Yes, uh, to Mr. Santosh, what uh, the reply, uh, replied by the uh, our EPI colleague is fully correct. I want to add one just one point for the vaccination. Actually, is done by Shuroka, but to support the vaccination, we have some additional system in the DHS too. One is vaccine reporting and vaccine logistics management, which we include in the DHS too as a national uh, COVID surveillance system. So that's a, a two addition to his point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to ask uh, Theodros uh, Zwede to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to ask the questions. My name is Theodros Zwede. I am a consultant for COVID vaccine introduction from UNICEF Menaro. Uh, <clears throat> I like to say a congratulations for the Bangladesh team for your successful work in digitalizing the system, especially uh, on campaign. And at the same time, I really appreciate the progress of the DHS to what uh, University of Oslo is doing, uh, because I, I use this DHS to system uh, across two countries and. I learned a lot uh, from the system, how much it's important comparing with uh, other uh, data management system or tools like Power BI, uh, Airtel and the like. So, uh, for example, in my experience, I had a chance to create dashboards even at district level in, in, in uh, for the data utilization at their level. So it is so useful, especially in uh, monitoring the routine immunization activities. And nowadays, even you are uh, upgrading to use at uh, 
uh, SI or camping and also for surveillance. In some countries, I had the chance to see also in recording digitally, uh, by what, what we call it, the tracking of the, uh, the uh, children who are registered for vaccination. And now it's also scaling up for COVID. So uh, really, this is a useful system. Uh, I can say DHS to has many, many advantages uh, in ensuring real-time monitoring. So when I come to my questions, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, as to my understanding, this data system is not almost established in uh, many narrow countries, like the North African countries and also Middle East countries. Uh, so what is, do you have any plan to reach these countries and start uh, this DHS2 system. Uh, my second question is, you know, uh, starting from the national like country level up to district in many uh, countries where you are working, you have established good system, uh, but from my observation and experience at the regional level, for the purpose of uh, monitoring the uh, implementation of uh, this uh, COVID vaccination or even a routine immunization at regional levels is not uh, common. Uh, what I mean, at the regional office level, many places, uh, you know, we use our BI or other system uh, just to create a dashboard and track the activities of countries. But as to my understanding from my experience, DHS is much better. Uh, what I mean is, you know, a person may enter a data at lower level, say it's in district uh, or national level of one country. So it's possible to get real-time data at regional level. But it's not, you know, or there is some limitation when you use Power BI you have to collect the data through different system and update okay your data at regional level manually so there are such kind of advantages so uh, i don't know what what uh, plan do you have just to uh, upgrade or scale up the system to a regional level thank you and thank you very much uh, for, for those questions, which I think are very relevant for other countries as well. Um, so, uh, Rebecca, perhaps uh, you might uh, want to respond. Uh, the first question regarding the plan for deployment of, of DHIS2 in countries where there may not be uptake uh, yet. And the other is uh, regarding, uh, I suppose, the advantages and the value um, of um, the use of, of DHIS2, uh, particularly around uh, dashboards, et cetera, and, and aggregation of uh, data um, as opposed to other digital solutions such as Power BI. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Raquel. Um, so I think on, on the first point, so I mean, a large number, one of, one of the real advantages of, of having some, some long-term collaboration with Gavi has been able to strengthen the, the EPI information systems in countries o over years so that they're really strong, starting with quite a strong foundation when, when they go to do something like um, an SIA activity or a campaign. And I think you maybe asked a bit about the, the EMRA region. Um, and, and there are actually quite a few countries, nearly all of, the countries in the EMRO region that I'm aware of, they, they use DHIS2 as, as some part of their system. Um, I think maybe only a handful are using it routinely for their EPI data. So they might not be at the same level of maturity with those systems yet as um, say perhaps Bangladesh is uh, with their national system uh, based in DHIS2. So there, there is um, a maturity model, not just of our software, but also of um, uh, countries implementation experiences and the, and the strengthening of that system. Um, so we have also worked with countries, um, for example, responding to some of the COVID-19 um, vaccine delivery requests. There, there have been several countries who have never used DHIS2, but all they have in place is, in, is Excel. Um, so for example, 
um, Mauritius and uh, Suriname, we, we worked with them quite quickly to, to get a solution going, at least to monitor the, the COVID-19 vaccination, um, because there just wasn't really a strong system in the country. So that is also uh, possible to start from the ground up, but there's, there's more work to do. Um, I think in terms of the analysis, um, so DHIS2, they have um, analytics features and functionality built in. But one of the really key things I want to differentiate between Power BI and DHIS2 is that Power BI is a data visualization tool. And it's it's not a, a platform and it's not a data warehouse. Um, it's not like a storage solution. It's not the place where you would structure your database. Uh, it's really just a visualization tool. Um, so in that sense, uh, we do support the analytics of DHIS2, but uh, many countries, they, they might wish to take that data from DHIS2 and actually do their visualization in Power BI or using other visualization tools. There are uh, examples of Tableau integration and, and other things like that. So, um, I mean, there is a robust uh, API to be able to, to pull data to other places. Um, but we do know that some of these, these tools are, are a little bit restricted for countries because they are generally proprietary or require licensing or subscription. So we feel committed to, to at least providing some good analytics solutions within the core software. Um, I hope that answered the question. I know there was a little bit about uh, regional reporting, but perhaps that's something we could uh, follow up if everyone has my contact info, I, I suppose. Um, but we have worked, for example, at the WHO Afro level around uh, developing a DHIS2-based uh, data warehouse at the regional level um, for vaccine-preventable disease surveillance, and, and also they're working on adapting that for, for capturing the COVID-19 vaccine monitoring. Um, so some of those ideas have uh, begun to be implemented and, and we're happy to talk about uh, any options around pushing up to regional reporting if you'd if you'd like thank you thank you very much uh, rebecca and uh, thank you raquel for for leading the, all the question and answers i think uh, i suggest that we we left to to end the session we we are still very uh, uh, you know, please to, to listen to each other, but uh, uh, I think it's time to, to release everyone. And I wanted to give a uh, um, huge appreciation for all the presenters and, and actually to all the, the, the team, uh, all the teams that are really working hard uh, for successful um, campaigns and, and reaching all the children. So huge thank you, huge thank you for for. Uh, Bangladesh government and partners and a uh, huge thank you for, for to UNICEF as well. Uh, you have been pushing us to, to really work on this area and this became a priority for us as well. So really thank you. And of course, a uh, big thank you to University of Oslo and all the HISP. Uh, you know, uh, we are partner for, for a while now and, and we want to continue the collaboration. Um, you can find on the on the slide, you know, some uh, contacts. Don't hesitate to uh, to approach uh, anyone. Uh, you know, if you have further uh, questions, comments, do not hesitate to to share the slides. And uh, you know, we are really learning from each other. And and again, thank you for for Bangladesh to to have taken from your time to share your experience. So uh, we will share the slide and the, and the recording and we can all keep in touch and we'll be happy to, to share another time, you know, uh, some of the experience I think is a, the best uh, to move forward. Thank you again and um, have a good afternoon or day to everyone. Bye-bye.